rolling, rolling, rolling. Though the streams are... Hello, welcome to Celluloid Mirror. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. On this show, we discuss film history, film uh, terminology, and then we go straight into the movies. Today, I've decided to um, discuss two movies near and dear to my heart. And both of them deal sort of with high fashion and sort of not. The first one we're going to look at is a beautiful Lana Turner movie called um, Imitation of Life. And it stars Juanita Moore, Troy Donahue, Sandra Dee, John Gavin, Susie Kona, Mahalia Jackson sings in it, uh, uh, Robert Alda, and Don O'Hurley. Makeup by Bud Westmore, who also did the makeup for the next movie that we're going to talk about. Produced by Ross Hunter and directed by Douglas Sirk, who also directs the next movie we're going to talk about. Uh, it's based on the Fanny Hurst novel, and the gowns were done by Jean-Louis. All right, so let's get into the movie. Um, Coney Island Mardi Gras, 1947, September 8th to September 14th, and Laura Meredith is looking for her little girl, uh, Susie, who happens to be befriended by uh, Juanita Moore's character, Annie, and her daughter, played by Susan Kona, her daughter's name is um, Annie, uh, pardon me, Sarah Jane. The two little girls and the women form a friendship over the years, a very unequal friendship. Um, Juanita Moore plays black woman who's hired by Lana to take care of her and her daughter, and uh, she's always calling Lana Miss Laura, and Lana never calls her Miss Annie, so it's just part of the plot. Uh, it's also a remake of uh, another movie that was made in 1934, which is probably even more tinged with um, that type of servile attitude between the two characters. Now, John Gavin, who plays Lana's love interest, is actually a pretty interesting person in real life, who's a Mexican Spanish descent, and served as ambassador to Mexico in the Reagan era. So he plays the photographer who's in love with Laura. Now, part of the reason why we're discussing this movie today is because Douglas Sirk made uh, what they call women's pictures back in the 50s. And as I study most of these women's pictures, um, it appears that the, uh, there's always usually a household of women. Men are on the periphery. Uh, sometimes they have the power, sometimes they don't. In our next movie that we're going to be checking out, women are key to the plot, uh, as are the relationships with men, but the women are of um, more important than the guys. So, just want to see if I, yeah, I wrote a couple paragraphs about the fact that in these pictures that were made before uh, the sexual revolution, the women are always in uh, dresses and skirts. They're usually wearing some type of hat wear. They have gloves. Um, the men are opening the doors for them. They appear to be uh, having, in a position of having to be taken care of. But when we look at Laura's uh, character, Lan Turner's character in this movie, not only does she um, have a will of steel and is very strong, she doesn't really, really need anyone to lean on her. And I think that um, movies like Gilda and uh, Laura and Notorious center on women who appear frail and fragile, but they triumph in the end. I happen to like movies like that, and I hopefully you all do too. Okay, so uh, the four women get together, they move in together. Uh, the mama and the child, who are black, they don't have anywhere to live. Sarah Jane is beyond high yellow, and all through the movie, that's part of the conflict. She wishes that she was white. She wants to be white. She disowns her ma several times. It's part of the heartbreaking part of the plot. Um, so as in most movies, the apartment Lana and Susie live in 
it's bigger than Montpelier, okay? Uh, the house that they later move in is lavish, swimming pool, all of that. Yet Susie, who, the daughter of the actress who makes it, suffers from a poverty of the spirit also. So it makes for a great old tearjerker smash up. Um, now, nowadays, and for, for me, this, uh, uh, it's just how I, I'm looking at it. In the 90s, the explosion of um, R&B became rap, and living in New Hampshire and Vermont, I saw guys wear baggy pants, they were dressing in urban wear, uh, the s styles changed, um, very different from the style that I was accustomed to in the 70s. Uh, grunge, maybe, but it was more than that. There's also an urban, um, a type of urban consciousness towards a bit of bling. So this movie can never be remade. You can never remake this movie, and that's one of the things I like about it, because nowadays, if you remade this movie, it would be Beyonce as the actress, upcoming black, with a black child, and it would be someone like maybe, oh, I don't know, um, what's that gal who was in the Hunter Grant Games? Someone like that playing the person taking care of her and her daughter wanting to be Beyonce's daughter. Do you know what I mean? Um, my friend Elisa in the 90s said, all of a sudden's really hip to be black. So this movie, it's such, it's what they call archaic, like uh, it's outdated and corny, but I love looking at it with a couple gal friends and snickering and, and um, just making fun of it. Check out the clothes, the clothes are great. Check out John Gavin's hat uh, when he first meets Lana and the girls on the beach there. Um, he's wearing this soft crushed felt fedora thing that I'd wear too. Okay, and I think that that's about it. Produced by Universal Pictures, made in 1959, I believe or maybe even 60. So the edge was that close. By the end of the decade, not only would styles change, but the role of women in pictures too. Let's cite Bonnie Clyde um, as that example. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde as that example, Faye Dunaway's character. All right, so our next film is Written on the Wind. Now, I kind of feel like I've done both of these movies on this show before, but it's warmer, getting warmer outside. The air feels a bit lighter, and we're all going to be dressing up. Uh, well, not so much dressing up, but dressing lighter, you know, nicer clothes. And this movie is another example of Bacall looks smashing, um, Rock Hudson's to die for. Okay, so Written on the Wind, also a universal movie in beautiful tenant color. Uh, again, Douglas Sirk, Sirk. We've got Rock Hudson, Lauren Bacall, Robert Stack, Dorothy Malone, Robert Keith, and John Larch, Albie, Albert Zug, Zug Smith, producer, and George Zuckerman did the script. Okay, a yellow roadster speeds through the night. It's obviously an oil town. There's big oil tanks all around, okay? And then we come to the residential. There's this yellow roadster, and it's still speeding through the night. And then we see Robert Stack, unfortunately, with the background on film behind him. So you know he's not driving. He's like guzzling some whiskey. So it sort of ruins the whole thing. But still, it's pretty exciting. We don't know what's going to happen next. He pulls up to the house. Rock Hudson is in a bedroom looking out the window, and Lauren Bacall's on the bed. From there, how can your attention not be grabbed by this thrilling woman's picture? Okay, so basically, uh, Lauren Bacall plays a nice girl working at an advertising agency. Rock Hudson is an engineer who works for Bob Stack and his pop, Robert Keith, big oil company, I think in Texas, Oklahoma. And um, both men kind of fall a bit in love with her, but it's Robert Stack's crazy, stalkerachi, crybaby butt that wins Lauren Bacall's affection. It's always the crybabies that kind of get the girls at first in the movies. Meanwhile, um, as you're checking out the triangul triangulation of the characters, here comes Dorothy Malone, looking beautiful and stunning. She plays Bob Stack's younger sister who's in love with Rock Hudson. Okay, so, and she makes plenty of trouble. Dorothy got an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, by the way, in this movie. And um, 
she later married that French actor, he's on the tip of my tongue. He was in a few, um, uh, Jacques Bergerac, uh, um, and I think that was her first husband. Um, so, uh, Rock is beautiful in this movie. Um, I mean, he's really, really beautiful. Uh, Kyle, unfortunately, is a spoiled louse, and it's partly Kyle's brutality towards Lauren, that's a major component, but the way that Rock Hudson plays a gentleman is really sweet, and so that's another part of the plot. Okay, now, um, again, we have re redemption for the heroine. Um, in all of these movies, the woman appears, uh, she's either single or, or she might be an adventuress or both, but um, she ends up placing herself and her heart's desire in the forefront by the end of the movie. Okay, which makes another favorite of mine, Duel in the Sun, uh, not a woman's picture. Uh, not simply because of the, um, I guess because of the way it turns out. On the other hand, Hanny Calder could be considered a woman's picture in my eyes a bit. Um, she gets revenge and she gets the guy. So, uh, Lauren Bacall is in the Aphrodite role. She is the desired one, looking like Anthena, however. She's looking like she's uh, really, really smart. Where else Dorothy Malone plays the Athena, the really, really smart, the archetype of the goddess but um, she is looking like Aphrodite. So I thought that was very interesting how, how the, the way that they looked, the roles were kind of switched off the cuff. Um, in Basic Instinct, Dorothy Malone gives Michael Douglas unshirted hell. I love the scant seconds that she is in that movie. Uh, she steals the so show. And she's in her 70s. She says a couple lines. Her eyes hit you like a thunderbolt. So, and that was her last movie. Check her out in Pain Place also. So um, obviously Ms. Malone is my favorite out of all the actors in the movie. But I just love that Rock Hudson. He um, was a, generally a nice guy in real life. And um, just what a hunk of a man. Okay. So... I think that that's it for the movie part. I wanted to mention that as I look around and search around for um, material to write about my show, I watch a lot of old 80s shows, um, some of them Canadian and some of them with uh, lots of nudity and violence. And one of them is The Hitchhiker. I'd love it if you all check it out. Um, it has some insane villains. Uh, you'll see Parker Stevenson. You'll see Virginia Madsen. Um, it sort of uh, shows like that Hitchhiker, Tales from the Crypt, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, not only uh, hired actors who were just between movies, but also hired talent that was up and coming. And so I think that you all ought to check out some of the... Um, the uh, old, uh, sit, uh, not sitcoms, but dramas and thrillers that would be on late night here in New England. Um, okay, so very, very briefly, I'd like to discuss um, the many Frankenstein movies that have been made over the years. Uh, the monster will always intrigue me. I have a soft spot for him. I have a soft spot for Victor, too. Um, the other characters, yeah, but especially for the monster. It wasn't his fault that Victor did that to him. So here's just a quick list of dates and movies that you can check out if you so choose. There have been many, many uh, renditions of this movie, as have been The Three Musketeers, A Star is Born, and um, anything that has to involve Elizabeth and Mary of Scots, okay? So, Charles Ogle starred in the first Frankenstein movie back in 1910, and in 1931, 1935, The Magnificent Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein was directed by James Whale with Boris Karloff in the titular role. 
1973, we had the Michael Serzon, Leonard Whiting, James Mason, and Jane Seymour production, which I watched as a child, and I really, really loved it. It was very, um, it seemed uh, very gritty to my eyes as a child. In 1994, we have Kenneth Bernard's excellent, excellent Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with Elena Bonham Carter, um, uh, John Cleese, Ian Holm, Tom Holtz, and of course, Robert De Niro. Great, uh, a great version. I, I like it especially for the costumes. And the music cracks me up though. The music is very operetta. Um, Kenneth always likes the music booming, but I still like it nevertheless. In 1986, Ken Russell uh, directed the production Gothic with Natasha Richardson, Gabriel Byrne, Julian Sands. It's a beautiful fever dream of a movie. I had quite a few nightmares after watching that one. The movie's only 90 minutes long or shorter. It feels like it takes three hours, and it uh, uh, concerns itself with the night that Frankenstein, the story, was created in Mary's head. In 1990, we have the excellent Frankenstein Unbound with uh, Raul Julia, Bridget Fonda, Michael Hutchinson, Jason Patrick, and John Hurt. It's a Robert, uh, pardon me, Roger Corman production, near and dear to my heart. I think you all ought to check those out. So. Um, I was briefly going to talk about the three scandals that have been consuming this country lately, Juicy Smollett, Loyal Laughlin, and R. Kelly, but I don't usually talk about non-movie entertainment. Maybe we'll go into that a little bit next week, but I just couldn't get away from all those three scandals as I was writing my show and doing schoolwork. On that note, we're going to say ciao. I'd like to thank the crew here at Orca. Gendron Building for its continued support over the years, Kellogg Hubbard Library for uh, supplying me with materials and also being just as supportive, and to my first film professor, Ochisana Sharon, uh, Warfield, Paris, Ardella, Ochisana Claridge for helping me eludicate and articulate myself concerning the silver screen. Until next time, darlings, stay away from those bad movies. Ciao.